104.7 The Cave, Mike the Intern, uh, very special interview today. You probably heard me talking about uh, Record Store Day a couple weeks ago, and I'd mentioned uh, one of the releases they had uh, was from a band that was in the Tulsa area back in the mid to late 60s called Marble Frog. Um, that record is uh, very sought after in the uh, record collecting world as being one of the most expensive and sought after psych records um, of the late 60s, and they repressed it for Record Store Day, so of course I had to grab a copy. I went on the air, started talking about it, and I had a woman reach out to me and say, hey, I heard you talking about my friend's band. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know those guys? She goes, yeah, I went to school with the guitar player. And I said, please, God, if there's any way you can get a hold of him, see if he wants to do a show, please, I would love to do an interview with him. And she made good on it and got me in touch with Hoppy Niles from Margle Frog, also in a bunch of other bands later on, more currently Uncle Zepp. And we'll get into that stuff in a little bit. But first of all, Hoppy, thank you so much for taking the time this morning for the show. I really appreciate it, sir. Hey, good morning, Mike. Thank you. Good it's really you. good to see you. Um, thank you so much for calling in. So let's start at the beginning. When and how did you hear about this record? Because, again, there was 100 copies, as far as I know, that were made. And that's part of the reason it's so valuable. But at what point did anyone say, hey, do you remember that Marble Frog record you made? Do you know how much that's worth? Uh, I, uh, 19, I think it was 1989, I believe it was. <clears throat> the, um, the other guitar player in the band, Marble Frog, had, he was uh, living in Tulsa. He ran a record store, Starship Records. And uh, I had moved back to Oklahoma from Chicago and had a band and, and he came to see me and he brought a gold mine magazine and uh, which is a collectible records magazine. Looks like a Rolling Stone, but anyhow, uh, it, we were listed in there as one of the 100 most valuable albums. Matter of fact, on the on the front page was the Beatles' Dead Babies album. Yeah. And then you open it up to like page five, I believe it was. And there was a, a full page of the back of our album cover. The art, there's artwork on there that's, that's pretty weird, pretty amazing. But and it then, fits uh, the genre. Later, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, then I started listening though. 100 most valuable albums there was a picture of the front of our cover and then it had a little paragraph saying that was listed for it was selling for well more than the listed price of 500 dollars. and that was back in 89 you know um so i that's when i became aware that it was it was worth something you then know? you went back I, home we don't and know you how said, many were actually i'm sorry did you just go back home and you're like okay i gotta find <laughs> i gotta find i yeah, know i have yeah, at least one or two <laughs> I had one, and and I'll be honest with you, um, I only kept one because we don't know how many were pressed. We think we thought maybe two fifty, but we're not sure if that's right or not, because um, we kind of bailed on the contract. We we weren't very happy with the recording quality, and uh, so we kind of bailed on the guy, and that's why there weren't that many out there. I I assume, you know, um, but I I've seen that thing listed. I've, I've heard people pay uh, up, upwards of almost two grand for some of them, depending on condition. And I saw one, a sealed copy. I don't know if it sold or not, but it was listed a couple of years ago online. They were asking $4,500 for it. You know, I have no idea if he sold it or not. But uh, anyway, it's possible. Anyway, 89, I guess it was when I figured out, heard that it was worth money. You know, That's we just were shocked. Bullshit. Yeah, I, I can't. I mean, it's just like if in one of the bands I was in in high school or college that we did a seven inch release or a CD, and then years later you get a call, hey, guess what? Those are selling for. I mean, it's it's possible, but what's amazing to me is that um, this record it's it's a really cool time capsule because um, I believe there are two original songs on that album. Is that correct? That you guys right. wrote yourselves. Right. And the rest are covers, right. and it's not that right. the the covers are are your take on those songs, but it's a really cool. I, I just thought it was a really cool release because it has those on there that fit into that time period and where everyone's head was at musically. But then you guys bring in your stuff, and it just wor works so well together. And I, it just blows my mind that all these years later you know we're still talking about something that essentially the way you explained it to me was just a bunch of dudes that were in a college band together yeah and those those were just songs that we did at gigs you know we played a lot 
and uh, that that was just the stuff we did at gigs, you know. And uh, we, you know, we started the band started in 1966 when we went to at Oklahoma State University. Uh, we got together, and um, actually, for the first year, we were called Captain Hook and the Pirates. Uh, you remember uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders was a big yeah. band, and and I've got yeah. a prosthesis, okay. Uh, and so we thought, hey, Captain Hook and the Pirates, cool name. But anyhow, about a year later, music started to change. And uh, Cream came out and Hendrix, Iron Butterfly. And uh, so we decided we needed to change our name. You know, Captain Hook wasn't cool anymore. So one night after a gig, we were, uh, the drummer and I were living in a, in a trailer, a uh, mobile home. And uh, everybody came over after a gig one night midnight or so and we said we've got to change our name we've got to have a new name and so we sat there and we threw out all kinds of names somebody said marble frog we go, no that's stupid you know and about four o'clock in the morning when everybody's passing out about to go to sleep somebody said hey it's marble frog and let's go to bed and uh but we decided to, to ah. spell it p-h-r-o-g-g -G. we thought that was cool so uh, yeah, Iron Butterfly, Marble Frog. That's that's how that came about. I love I love that every band has had that time. Every single band has always been. It's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, it's like yeah. Marble Frog. Screw it. We're done. Let's screw move it. on. We're done. Let's go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love it. Something else, uh, Hobby did tell me, which I thought was very interesting, uh, was when they went on to repress this record for the most re recent record store day. Um, they uh, came to find out that the obviously the master tapes had been destroyed because you know hindsight's 2020. 20. You when you made this record, you probably had no idea what it ended up would happen with it. But um, so go through the process of what they did to actually repress that record. Well, we were actually about a year ago, we were contact contacted by actually a guy in Spain first, and uh, he put us in, in he wanted to redo the album, put us in touch with a guy in Denver. And I talked to him and I didn't really like him a whole lot, real business guy. And, and yeah. I didn't, you know, um, and he didn't offer us very much money. And just like a week later, I got uh, contacted by another guy here in Oklahoma that wanted to do the same thing. And a really nice guy uh, runs a record store here. And I guess they've done this before and uh, made us a much, much better deal. And so we decided to go with him. Uh, we searched and searched to try and find the uh, Bill Davis was Bill Davis, Derek records. He owned Derek records, but he was actually a school teacher. I knew him and he taught for a couple of years. And I grew up in Guthrie, Oklahoma, and uh, he taught high school there for a couple of years. He was a guitar player. And uh, then he moved on to Tulsa. Three of the guys in our band were from Tulsa. So we always said we're a Tulsa band. Two of us were from Guthrie and, and three of us were from Tulsa. And um, anyhow, Bill contacted us and said, you know, I want to record the album or record an album. And uh, so we did. We, we actually did this uh, in two different places. I remember one one of the places was a vacant office building. You know, we, we built baffles and stuff and, and did that. And the other one, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was in the basement of an old bank or something. I, I can't <laughs> remember. remember. Um, but anyhow, uh, we tried to contact Bill. Uh, don't don't think Bill's alive anymore. Uh, but we did get a hold of a guy that, or actually, he contacted us. But the drummer Roger Worley had gone to high school with this guy, and he said he had met him. He had seen him at a uh, reunion and gave him gave Roger a sealed copy of the album. And uh, he said that he was supposed to have been a distributor for the album, and originally he had, he had twenty five of them. And so I went up to Tulsa and met with him, and he gave me three sealed copies of the album. And we, uh, there was a couple of 45s made, too. There was one of the original songs on it. On the other side was Fire by Hendrix. Mm -hmm. And I think there was another 45, and I, I can't really remember. I don't know why they did two, but there was another one, and it had a different song, cover song on the back of it. I can't actually remember right offhand. But anyhow... Uh, Due to the fact we couldn't, the masters, we got a hold of a guy that knew Bill and said that the masters had been recorded over. And so we, I, I met with the guy and got uh, three sealed copies. And uh, the, the person that uh, 
the people that that redid the album used one of the seal copies for that and transferred it over open it up yeah i watched him open it up and and that's that's how they did it man know? what an incredible what an incredible story but um hobby didn't just stop at marble frog obviously you've been a musician you've been in a career musician your entire life um yeah. as you mentioned <laughs> uh you have a prosthetic um your I, I believe it is your strumming hand right that you that it is, is. Yeah, yeah. Gotta hook. where's that okay which yeah, that was the, that, that was the other part of the story was like i can't believe i'm making this connection with this record i just bought from the guy who made it and then he he tells me over the phone yeah i play with a hook and i go on your, yeah. your a hook and he goes no my a prosthetic and i go wow the story just got even more incredible <laughs> yeah yeah I, I've, I've been playing all my life settling you know all my life i actually after after uh everybody flunked out of college you know i <laughs> I was not the lead singer on this particular song i am a lead singer and i have been since since shortly after the the record was recorded uh mike freeman was the lead singer we actually going back we we uh had the five musicians together i'm sorry this is going back a bit we had the five musicians together and we're at rehearsal and somebody said we need a singer and I said, well, let me try. And I sang like two songs and they go, eh, we need a singer. And so <laughs> we we found Mike Freeman. Thanks, he fronted the band, played a little bit of keyboard, but mostly fronted the band. But uh, shortly after the record was, record, uh, was recorded, we, we were all flunking out of school because we played we played music almost we yeah. were busy. We, we played music constantly, more often at OU in Norman uh, than actually in, in Stillwater, but around the state. Um, Anyhow, the, the uh, I've lost my train of thought. Hang on. What were we talking about? Your I've lead been playing singing, music lead, all my life, yeah, right? The, the or guy who sang lead on the, the Marble yeah, Frog okay. record. Uh, yeah, uh, Vietnam was going on, and the draft got got Mike. And uh, and, and music, like I said, music had changed. You know, Led Zeppelin had just come out, and uh, which blew my mind. And that's where my vocal range was. So when Mike got drafted, I became the lead singer. And then we started doing a lot of Led Zeppelin and stuff. But uh, we, we, uh, the last bass player I had in the Marble Frog, I had a couple. After people got started getting drafted, Roger went to the Navy because he was going to get drafted. And uh, anyhow, I started changing guitar players and drummers and stuff. And the last bass player that I, uh, like, imp I imported him from Wichita, Kansas. And we started having trouble with, with the bass player and the other guitar player. And there was a, a band called the Moaning Glories, a big, uh, in, in Wichita, they were a very big band. And actually we played there a lot and we were well known. And they, Moaning Glories broke up and Rick said, hey, let's, let's go up to Wichita and talk to a couple of those guys and see if we can put a band together. And we did, and we're instantly well known and so, uh, three of the guys were from Wichita, so I moved to Wichita. Uh, we played up there for about three years. Then I moved on to Denver, played there for a couple of years. Couldn't make a living there because it was all top 40, and I was not a top 40 person. And uh, so we, um, I was in a trio, and we wanted to add another player. And I, the, the last bass player I had in that band had just moved there from Chicago. And he goes, I know a guy. And so we flew him into Denver. He played with us for about a week, stayed there for a week. We rehearsed and he actually sat in at a gig and he flew back home. And about a month later, he called back and said, yeah, I want to join the band, but you guys need to move to Chicago because this is where the work is. And he was right. So in 75, summer of 75, we packed up and, and went to Chicago, which I think at the time was probably the greatest place for a working rock and roll band to be. There was so many bars and clubs, they were big, huge clubs. You could play anywhere from, from uh, what they call the Chicago land area, which was uh, Northern Indiana up to Milwaukee and Madison, uh, Wisconsin, and go, go home at night. Actually, for the first two years, we didn't do that. We were on the road. Uh, we spent, we play around Chicago for a couple of months and then we, we hit the road for two or three months. Uh, all around the Midwest, you know, as far out as Arizona, you know, New Mexico, Arizona, up to Wyoming, Colorado, Wyoming, down to Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, and we did that for a couple of years, but, you know, it, the road crew had to get paid and we, 
we constantly were spending money on blowing PA stuff and having to fix it. And if you didn't pay the road crew, they'd quit. And so we finally figured out that if we stayed in Chicago, we could play that, that Milwaukee and go home at night, you know, Northern yeah. Indiana and go home at night, sleep our own bed and start, started making a lot more money, you know? So, uh, you know, that was cheap trick was just coming on as a, as a big, big bar band. They just hired Robin. They had another singer for about a year. His name was Zeno. And uh, they fired him and they found Robin uh, playing in a folk music in a, uh, a, a you know, what coffee houses. And uh, anyhow, we, we got to, I got to know those guys really well. We played a lot of gigs together and stuff. And Robin and I became pretty good friends. Um, anyhow, I stayed in Chicago for 12 years. I had, uh, the band was called Angel. And about a year after that, a band from New York named Angel came out with a record called Angel. So we changed our name to Pinups. That band, I was in it for about four and a half years. And I got a call one day. I was watching the Dinah Shore show. And there was England Dan and John Ford Coley on. And I knew those guys. They were in a band. They were from Dallas. And they used to play a lot of gigs at OU. And we, we did, too fraternity gigs and stuff well, we became friends and uh about a week after i i saw these guys on tv i got a phone call from the lead singer i mean i'm sorry the, the guitar player lead guitar player uh ovid stevens and uh he said man long time i haven't talked to you in 15 years but he said the last tour through chicago i got married i met a girl and got married to a girl from chicago and he goes we're planning to leave Dan and John and we need a front man. And she says, you're the guy. And I was on the top of the music scene in, in Chicago and it was really a hard decision to make, but eventually I made the decision. They flew me out there and, and uh, I spent a week with them and, and came back and they called me every week going, we want you, we want you. And I made the decision to go out to LA and I got out there and it sucked. It was a <laughs> bad decision, man. I, and when I, that was over, when I quit that deal, my manager was out there and Cheap Trick's manager, Ken Adam and he were out there to, to get, my manager owned a little piece of Cheap Trick. And uh, so I met with, I met with him and said, man, I want to stay in LA. I like it out here. And Ken said, I don't know anything about LA, but I've got an office here and there's a guy that runs it for me, go meet with him. So I met with him for like three different times and played him my music and stuff. And he goes, man, you need to go back to Chicago. He said, nobody knows who you are out here. You'll have to wait tables or something to make a living. You can go back to Chicago and you can put a band together and you can get a recording contract just as quick there as you can here. So I went back to Chicago and, uh, and I played in a few different bands. And finally, I, uh, I was approached one night by a guy in a, in a band called Star Trooper. And he said, we want to fire a singer. We need a sing new singer. And we think we want you. And uh, so I went to listen to him one night and I didn't like him. And I said, I don't think this will work out. And they go, man, please just, just let's meet, let's talk. Uh, okay. So they, they came back to my apartment and, and uh, I played my music for them and stuff or they'd heard it anyhow. And they, they convinced me that I, at least to go rehearse with them, you know? And so I did. And man, it was great. It worked out. It worked out great. And so I joined Star Trooper and about, Two months later, we became one arm bandit. The, they, you know, the, all their music changed. We were playing a lot of original stuff, mostly original stuff, my stuff and their stuff. And uh, anyhow, we, it became one arm bandit. And that lasted about four and a half years. Um, you know, drugs took their toll on the band, yeah. and uh, as it does on a lot of bands. Yeah. And so when we broke up, I played in another band for about a year. And when that band broke up, I came home, I'd gotten married while I was up there, and I came home one day, I was really mad, and I said, let's move to Oklahoma. And my wife, I never dreamed she would say, okay, but she did, it freaked me out. And But a month later, we were gone, we, we moved back to Oklahoma, and I've been here, since, and that was 87, and I've been back here ever since. That's and awesome. And I've used that name, One Arm Bandit, quite a bit. Uh, the, I, had a, I had One Arm Bandit, and uh, you know, changed members had like I don't know how many members. You know, changed guitar players several times and drummers and blah blah blah. Anyhow, I got it. I got a band finally together about probably 15, 16 years ago, 
and we play we do lots of Led Zeppelin and because uh, that's where my vocal range is and uh, we would do three or four Zep tunes every set and people would just freak out over it and funny the drummer kept going let's just do all Zeppelin I think we can make more money and went, you know you're crazy you're crazy one uh, we, we had a gig at an arts festival and they only gave us like 40 minutes to play and he said let's do all Zeppelin and see what happens so we did and people just went crazy and uh, we ended up playing for about an hour and we had a meeting after that said maybe maybe he's right so we changed our name to Uncle Zepp and we started doing all Zeppelin and that's what we do today yep that's awesome that's what we still well, do matter of fact I don't know if you've seen my shirt oh yeah Uncle, yeah Uncle, that's awesome Uncle, we'll call we Uncle do Zeppelin Zepp. <laughs> we do Zeppelin I love that yeah, so much yeah uh, so again, if you are in the uh, Oklahoma area and you see that Uncle Zepp is playing somewhere, don't miss out on seeing these guys. Um, just an incredible story. Hoppy, I cannot thank you enough for your time. It's been a pleasure meeting you and talking with you over the last week or so. I am so thankful for your time. Um, this is why I love doing this job. It's this stuff right here because this is why ma music is magical. And, you know, uh, really at the end of the day, if your kid's in a band and they cut a little single CD or a seven inch and they're super proud of it, and you're like, oh my God, this isn't so good. You might want to hold on to it because you never know 40, 50 years later down yeah. the road, it could be worth a thousand dollars. I wish I'd kept a bunch of them. I only kept one because <laughs> I didn't take much of it. So thanks. Uh, Unclezep.com. Lots of, lots of videos on, on YouTube and uh, whatever. If you want to see where we're playing, you can look that up. Find out Thank where you Uncle so Zepp is going to be. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Absolute pressure is all mine, Hoppy. Thank you so much. UncleZep.com. Check out Marble Frog, too. The album is great, Hoppy. Thank you so much, sir, for your time, and it was a pleasure meeting you today. Thank you, Mike.